Hey, food friends, and welcome to the Food Founders Podcast. Whether you're looking to get on your very first store shelf or you're looking to grow your national or even international food brand, this podcast is going to teach you what it really takes to launch, grow, and scale a packaged food brand. Hear the food founder journeys of brands growing in their industry so you can fast track your food business success. I'm your host, Ainsley, and this is the Food Founders Podcast. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Food Founders Podcast. I'm your host, Ainsley, and today I'm thrilled to have with me Angela Millen and Mama Millen of Pure Batch on the show. Angela, Mama Millen, welcome to the Food Founders Podcast. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having us. So awesome to have you guys on here. We were introduced from a common food friend, which everyone who's listening, you're in the food industry, you know, it is just such a tight community. Um, And that's what I love about it. That's what everyone loves about this industry. So, so grateful for introductions to wonderful food founders like you guys. Can you kick it off by letting everyone know what is Pure Batch and what led you guys to start this? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I always say that, you know, my mom's the baking and I'm the business, so I'll kick it off for you. But Pure Batch is our company. You know, we founded it in 2015 and it's really all in response to my mom's journey after surviving breast cancer. Um, so in addition to where we say don't fear the treat, we also say that she really made lemonade out of lemons. So rolling it back a little bit, I'll give you give you the good backstory. So after beating breast cancer, you know, my mom, I, she lived her best life. I always say she kind of did whatever she wanted. She ate whatever she wanted and she deserved it. I mean, everybody, everybody deserves that after going through <laughs> that type of treatment. But, you know, she also found that with indulgence in bad ways comes repercussions. So she hit a high number on the scale. Her health was suffering and her doctors kind of scared her and said, you know, cancer breeds in unhealthy environments. And not only could that come back, but you could develop other issues that you're not even expecting. You got to get this under control. And it really scared her. And so she, unbeknownst to anybody in our family, we're super tight. I grew up across the street from my aunt, her sister, and uh, my cousins. And so there's like no secrets in a big Italian family. So for somebody to like go rogue is a little wild. Um, and my mom decided to see this nutritionist and dietitian on her own. And honestly, it really changed her whole life. This whole world of ingredients was opened up to her. And for a while, we like laughed because she like fully thought she invented quinoa and she did not. We were all eating it. But like it, it came to her as like this new amazing ingredient. But that was it. It was all these ingredients that she just didn't know existed. And always being this amazing home cook, she just needed that sort of push in the right direction. And so in the course of, you know, ideating on recipes, she was looking for a sweet treat. She looked up all these brownie type recipes and she hated them all. So she said, I'm going to do my own, very my mom. And she created this black bean brownie recipe. She brings it to the dietitian. She says, you know, what do you think? Can I eat this? Is this okay? And this woman basically was like, you could live off of this, eat as much as you want of this. This is crazy. And the story goes, she ate at least a brownie a day and lost 50 pounds in less than a year. And while that's amazing, we want to be very careful. We are not a weight loss company, but that was a very big part of my mom's health. She needed to lose that weight, but it was also about her being able to have something that she enjoyed. And, you know, she started making them for our family, our friends, very small business start. And she looked at me and she said, you know, do you think we have something here? Do you think we have a business? And I said, no, you have a brownie. You do not have a business. And I'm not really interested necessarily in starting a business off a brownie, but you know, I kind of like said, if you could come up with some more products, we'll talk about it. And because she's her, she had like 26 products in a very short amount of time. And as I am a woman of my word, we made a company. And that is how Pure Batch was born. The other fun part of that story is we really jumped right in to just testing the market. And our first uh, real launch was at this farmer's market, the Margate Farmer's Market in New Jersey. And we went every other week. Great farmer's market. Great farmer's market. <laughs> we love them. Great farmer's market. And we did about 20000 in sales at this one farmer's market. And that was the real litmus test to say, okay, let's see. Let's see what can happen here. That is such a 
beautiful story of like truly taking lemons and making lemonade and finding a product that allows you to like enjoy a sweet tooth, but also be true to something that you're committed to, which is health. Mama yeah. Millen, I'm curious, what made you think that you wanted to take this to like the business level? You had this great product. You were loving it. It helped you. Your family was loving it. A ton of people would just leave it at that. What made you want to take it to the world? It really was because I felt it was missing out there. Mm. Like if I didn't have it, I was a foodie and I knew everything out there in the grocery stores. So I just thought this is a great thing to share with people. People should know that they can have an indulgence, indulgence without any guilt. No guilt associated with it. It's clean. It's healthy. It makes you feel good. It should be out there for us. And isn't it something too that like you found, you know, with the, with the relationship back to cancer, like as something that, you know, you were looking for something that didn't make you feel bad, especially at that point in your life and nothing was there then and being able to kind of like offer that to people too. Right. Because when you, well, for me, when I went through breast cancer or when I, at least when I got my diagnosis, I remember thinking I did something wrong. You know, this is my fault. Why is this happening to me? So you go through all of, you know, these kind of feelings to kind of figure an answer that really doesn't exist. Right. And so when I was, you know, trying to eat during chemo, I kept thinking to myself, I I don't want to eat anything really bad for me. I want to try to replenish what's already in there. Um, with some some good stuff. And I just couldn't find it. And while people love to send you wonderful gift baskets, and I was so appreciative of all of that, I just couldn't kind of get it down. So in a way, you know, I felt like this was just, it just needed to be out there. And certainly at 56 years old, starting a business, it just took on a whole, a whole nother animal to me, really new. Had either of you guys ever run a business before? No, 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 no. Why would we have done that? That would be <laughs> crazy. Like, that would be nuts. No. That would have made it easy. Yes. No, what I was I was a challenge. <laughs> I was really lucky at the time that we started Pure Batch, I had started working and I'm still working in um a director of business development role at a different company. And I was very early on in that company. I was employee two. And so I was watching a business get built alongside my business, and that was very inspirational to me. But in terms of us having our own business experience, nope, we just went totally rogue and decided, yeah, let's try. Why not? <laughs> What's the worst that can happen, right? Exactly, right? No and risk I'm, reward. Exactly. And you have a product that you like clearly see the world needs. And yeah, you just went with it. I'm sure the farmer's market seeing those sales there, you're like, okay, we've got something. Talk to me about that in terms of seeing the sales at the farmer's market, it's doing well, you know, you're on to something. How did you end up going from that to be like, okay, we're definitely expanding this, making it large. And also I'm really curious when you look at the brand, which I think you guys have a great brand, super like kind of LA beach vibes, definitely Mm -hmm. getting that. You guys didn't necessarily go too deep on the health angle. You went lifestyle. And I think that that is a piece that a lot of people would, I don't know, really struggle with. How did you guys end up to go lifestyle? And and what made you guys decide to go like, we're going all in. We're not just staying to the farmer's markets. It's funny. It's like you hit on on so much of what I hope to achieve. So I'm thank you for saying that. And for me, it really was about a lifestyle brand. I have a little background in licensing and that licensing background taught me that lifestyle brands are always going to be the most successful. And when I had somebody like my mom as, you know, the front and the face of this company, I knew very quickly during the farmer's market with the way that she was communicating with these customers, that it was important that it could grow and develop a life of its own. And it wasn't just about the product. I think what's crazy to note about the product is that we're 13 out of 14 major allergen free. So we're certified organic that's on its own, but then we're certified gluten-free, vegan, soy-free, peanut-free, um, you know, obviously no shellfish, um, no egg, no dairy. 
So there is tree nuts in the product and coconut in the product. Um, but other than that, it is as clean and you can eat every single ingredient by itself as raw as you could get. And making products like that, you know, especially without dates, that is a real key component of Pure Batch. The fact that we have managed to to build these recipes out without a dates binder, which is pretty much what everybody else leans into. That was such a such a real success point that we found in talking to people. And on top of that, you know, these kids, they would come up and they would, they would talk to my mom. And if they couldn't have something, if let's say their allergies prevented them at that time from having one of our products that we were showcasing and selling, she would go back and she would make them a new product for them and bring it back the next time we were at the farmer's market. So like this idea that she is everybody's mom and she wants the world to eat, essentially, <laughs> is like really important to the core of the company. So we found a lot of that. And, and my thoughts about that really kind of were coming a little true at that time um, that we were selling at this, you know, little, this little folding table. So really, we sort of hit a wall because we had hit enough in sales that we had no choice because of cottage laws in New Jersey we had to go into some sort of contract manufacturing facility. And because of all of the parameters of the product, there really was no shared space that we could go into. And you are right. We, in some ways, are the right company on the wrong coast. There is a little bit more availability out on the West Coast for um, making products like ours in shared spaces. But especially in you know 2016, there was nothing in that we could find that would hold us. And still, we we still have not found a shared space. So... We sort of jumped in, you know, feet first and uh, built out our own um, production facility in Hillsboro, New Jersey. And that was a learning experience in and of itself. Um, and at the time, we also were building our certifications. So we were able to do them in tandem. My mom is one of the only people in the history of companies, I think, that's done the organic certification by hand for 26 products. So that's <laughs> that's an adventure in and of itself. But, you know, we built out a structure to allow us to grow. Um, and that was really all of 2017. In 2018, we did sort of like a soft launch with a completely different style of packaging. So the way that the brand looks now isn't what it looked like when it first came to market. Um, it was much more artisanal looking. Uh, the logo was entirely different. They were in these sort of craft boxes, very farmer's market. And we very quickly learned that that was not going to work at retail. And our test market was successful in that way. It really called out that we needed to be a grab and go, a grab and go product. We needed to be single serve. We needed to be packaged in a way that really grabbed your attention because we're in the refrigerator. So the only products that we really follow out there mainstream are Perfect Bar and Hail Mary. And they've done an amazing job at uh, are really paving the way in this category, which still is just ever evolving and growing. But there really was, you know, challenges in finding space for us where people could see the product and go to try it. So I, I quickly uh, jumped in with a um, branding and design agency that only works with vegan companies, Harmless Studios. They're out of Rhode Island. And they became kind of my other arm. We together recreated this brand where I like to think that the brand kind of feels like me and the products really feel like my mom. And that's you know, even down to the logo, you know, her signature Mama Millen is on the back of the packaging, but we worked to find and create sort of this font that was in um, essence and inspired by her handwriting. So, you know, a lot of attention to detail behind that lifestyle idea. And yeah, that's, that's really where we, where we come to today. We relaunched uh, with this branding at Expo in 2019. The feedback was amazing. We had clearly done what needed to be done in order to get it into that mainstream retail market. And then we can talk about, you know, what 2020 is brought for all of us. <laughs> but we were there. We were ready. <laughs> okay. Before we dive into 2020, because I know, heck, 2020, what a year. Um, how much easier were your conversations when you guys had a lifestyle brand versus not? I know this is something that people, they struggle with. It's like this chicken and the egg. And I'd love them to hear from you guys how it changed in terms of ease. I, a different brand. They were completely different conversations. I mean, entirely different conversations. Um, I think there, look, there's, there's pros and cons, right? The con is that we have a lot of SKUs. So that for some retailers is just too much to take in on a new brand and something that we learned and kind of evolved with understanding 
So while we have seven SKUs that we're selling, you know, DTC on our website, we're really only pushing four SKUs for retail at this time because really people need to get to know who we are. And that's what sells the product. It's really the story that sells this amazing, delicious, nutritious product. But when you really get to know us, it's it's that that gets you to press the button to buy. So yeah, I, I think um, it's it's almost like night and day conversations. Um, there, there's almost no comparison. The only thing that has been consistent since the beginning is the taste. People eat this and they are not expecting to like it. <laughs> They're not, you know, we convert people all the time. Um, into thinking that, you know, if it's gluten-free and it's vegan does not mean that it needs to taste bad. Like don't fear the treat does not mean that you have to literally like be afraid to eat something for any reason. So yeah, it was, it was an amazing shift in pretty much every single way when we relaunched. Okay. Then what has 2020 brought you guys? You talk about the fact that when people tried it, you know, you converted them so easily with sampling gone now with Mm -hmm. retail completely changing. How has that impacted you guys and how are you managing with all of that? So it has been interesting to say the least. Um, so essentially continuing to walk you through the timeline, um, after Expo, you know, there were some key retailers that were really interested in the product. We really had to lock up distribution. We had sort of all of those pieces figured out by March, literally about 10 days before COVID crashed its angry head down on all of us. We had signed our distribution agreement. We were excited. We were waiting for the POs. And it was it was really like for sure happening. And then it wasn't happening. And it was just like from absolute one extreme to the absolute other extreme. And at first that was really hard, I think, on both of us because it's it really is like such a heart and soul product. And we really got it to the place of, of being able to move. And, you know, you get negative a little bit, right, at first. And you, you get frustrated and I think what we've learned in the past few months is that we were actually really lucky because had we had we gone to market as this type of a product with you know the perishable factor in play, it would have sat in the distribution warehouse and it would have never moved and we would have lost a tremendous amount of money and a tremendous amount of leverage and that we you can't get that back. So the fact that it it happened like when it did we now have sort of repositioned our own minds to say, you know what, it was a blessing in disguise because now we've gotten to explore all of these different alternate channels and partnerships and ways of going to market that we probably wouldn't have if everything had gone according to plan. So who's to say what would have happened? But I know that in the course of life that did happen in in the real and true story, the likelihood of it having been a success, just like you said, without being able to sample without us being able to get in there and demo and really push brand awareness and presence, it it would have been very, very hard if possible at all. You guys seem like a team of people that continuously make lemonade out of lemons here. (laughs) That's our whole mantra. (laughs) With organic coconut palm sugar and a little maple syrup. Hey, there we go. There we go. (laughs) Keep keep that low guy semen, Ainsley. (laughs) Um, But yeah, you know, it's, it's it's been really great to be able to pivot in a positive way. It didn't happen overnight. Like I will not lie to you. It was not at first so fun, (laughs) but once we sort of re-wrangled it and yeah, I, you know, it, once we were able to see the positives of how we could reposition, it opened us up to just a lot of different opportunities that we're still exploring. So have you guys focused more on a DTC or was that always part of the plan and you've just doubled down on that now? I mean, DTC was always something that we did, but it wasn't necessarily the focus because we had worked to build this brand to sit on a refrigerated shelf. You know, we really felt that that at the time was where it should be. Where it's sort of pivoted now is, you know, alternate channels and, you know, third party sellers and and DTC really looking at the affiliate space and understanding how to grow the brand that way. We've learned a lot. We have a partnership with Sunbasket that's been amazing uh, where we're offered in their marketplace. And, you know, that was really, that was really great for us because we learned that if we just, if we find our audience already established and we just go to the audience as opposed to having to find ways for the audience to come to us, 
that's a that's a real game changer pretty quickly. Um, and it's a way to get you know that brand awareness moving a little faster. And so we're going to continue to look at opportunities like that. Um, smaller distributors really trying to help in whatever way we can. You know, the independent retailers, especially now, those are the, the retailers that really helped us at the beginning. And we hope that we can you know continue to work with them. Um, there's so many different ways of going to market now. And I think that's what we're really learning. We're learning that not only is, you know, the mind of the shopper shifting, we're learning that traditional retail has to change. And the more conversations I have with founders, um, especially in the food space, everybody has the same opinion and the same feelings. And it's, it's nice to sort of have this community, like we said at the start of the call, you know, the food community is really special. Um, we have calls all the time to just like toss back and forth knowledge because you have to, you have to kind of make it, you have to make it work in a way that won't just benefit you. We're not just trying to make it work for us. You know, we hope that, you know, the things and the lessons that we learn and the things then the lessons that we can take from someone else, eventually we can figure out a better way of doing this. It kind of needed to be flipped upside down, I think, anyway. So this was a, a good reason to to make that possible. Yeah, it's definitely poked some holes in how it's working. And especially for smaller food producers, new food producers. And I think that this is just going to give a lot more opportunity for them to look at things differently, help pave the way. And you're right, like in terms of the food industry working together, if there are just more and more healthy alternatives, the retailers are going to be forced to continue to carry them as long as consumers are buying them. And then all of a sudden we have a food industry that is lined with, you know, food products that do the body good um, Mm -hmm. as they should be versus products that are potentially harming us, right? I mean, look at the trends in plant-based. Look at what the plant-based industry has done in such a short amount of time. Forget the organics industry. That is just up and up and up and up and up. Plant-based and alternatives are, I mean, the rapid growth is insane. And really being able to say, you know, we're disrupting the snacks industry. We're disrupting the market. We're using the right ingredients the right way to make a product where you don't need to have this idea of a cheat day. Our whole society is built on this concept of like, you have to cheat and it you don't yeah, like, I don't want to even, sometimes I say every day could be a cheat day. And it, it's more than that though. It's like, you just shouldn't have to sacrifice taste for nutrition or nutrition for taste. And I think the more that that message through companies like ours can be executed at market, you know, the more growth you're going to see even beyond what's already happened. So I think it's, I think it's pretty incredible. Talk to me about how you guys manage running a business with family, like mother, daughter. Talk to me about how that is. How do you guys manage that? (laughs) So I used to say that uh, it was good that there was a bridge and a tunnel in between us when I lived in Manhattan, but (laughs) that was always my joke. Um, No, it's great. I mean, I'll I'll let my mom speak to that one because I've I've hogged up a little of the convo, but it's it's great. It's really special. It works out really well because I know what I'm good at. Angela knows what she's good at. And the two of us come together and make it work. So I'm here at the uh, facility uh, overseeing all the operations in New Jersey. And Angela is now in Pittsburgh overseeing all the marketing, all the sales stuff, all the business stuff. So I think it's a great mix. I think we just feed off of one another. And what better way to like pass the day than run a business with your daughter? as a mom, there's no better day. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. That's so beautiful. And like you guys just feed off each other so well and you complement each other in the business. And I can see that n- that special bond that you guys have comes through in terms of the product and the branding that you guys have put forth with everyone as well. Exactly. It's cool to see, you know, it's cool to see her too at like her late fifties having like this much energy. And like when people are slowing down, like she's ramping up. And, you know, I think that's really special too, to be able to say that, you know, I know that if I call my mom with a task that is personal or professional, it's done faster than like anybody I've ever worked with before in my life. Like she just has this (laughs) ability to do more than anyone I've ever known. And I think that's also what makes it easy to kind of rely on her as a partner, because if she doesn't know what to do, she'll figure out what to do. Mm. She's not like leaving you in the trenches. She is going to like dig her teeth in and and understand whatever she needs to. And I think that's, that's really inspiring for anybody at any age, but certainly, 
you know, as you've already, you know, grown your children and, and even if you had careers in the past, I mean, anything is possible. Mm, absolutely. You can accomplish more than you think. Yeah. Yeah. Even 59 almost. <laughs> <laughs> it's no secret. It's out there, mom. It's out there. <laughs> it's out there. <laughs> and you know what? I'm proud of it. I'm not one of those women who wants to hide her age. I'm perfectly open and, and totally authentic with it. And I'm happy to be here. Yeah. I'm absolutely. very happy to be here. And at 59, I might say, all the young girls that are working for me, all those 20 somethings, I'm doing circles around them at five o'clock. <laughs> so, okay. You're like that. You've got all the fuel. You've been fueling yourself. <laughs> all the delicious product. They're, they're plant based products. It's all plant based. And exactly. I, just, I feel like I'm putting all good stuff in, and what you put <laughs> in, you get out, right? Low well, glycemic sugar and that sort of sustainable energy. It's good. It does the body good. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, if you guys were to go back in time to when you just started, is there anything, I mean, I'm sure there's lots that you wish you knew then that you know now, but what is like one piece of advice you would give yourselves as you were sitting there wondering if you're going to move forward with it, how to move forward with it? What would that be? I think that it's something I'm still working on, but the idea of being perfect is impossible. So waiting for it to be perfect is never the answer. Just put it out there. Just get it out there. And I think that is something I wish I could have told myself a few years back. It it would have been easier for us to find the flaws a little faster um, and get to where we are now a little faster if I wasn't so worried about the meticulous details that didn't matter then. So I think that that is the advice that I would give any entrepreneur is it's not about being perfect. It's just about being you and being good. How about you, Mama Millen, any advice that you would give you guys when you were just starting out here? Well, when you're first starting out, you know, you don't realize really what's involved and you don't realize how much it's going to cost. So I think if I had to turn the clock back a little bit, um, I probably would have paid more attention to um, crowdfunding or um, a friends and family um, because we are self-funded. And because these products are organic, um, all those ingredients come at a cost. And so a little bit of that, um, yeah, would have been a little different. Learning more about like the incubators and the accelerators and things earlier on. Right. right. And kind of, again, kind of falling in this world of like not being perfect. Like you don't have to have a perfect PL. and you don't have to have a perfect business plan. Um, and sometimes trying to get there when you, you either don't know how or you don't have enough information to make it make sense. Like you're better off just going for it and letting them tell you what you need to fix or what you need to update or what you need to learn. But I think, you know, that that does definitely fall into funding too. Um, There's lots of options out there that you just have to, you have to do a little bit more digging than you realize, but they're out there. There's organizations and funds, pre-seed and and all of these great opportunities that we're exploring now that I would have loved to explore in, you know, 2017. And what about what's next for you guys? You guys are obviously working on this new post COVID plan. Um, what's next for the business and what are some of the learnings that are coming with that? Oh gosh, what a good question. Um, you know, I think that we're really excited about, um, a new partnership that we have with Mabel. Uh, Mabel is a, um, sort of like a, a micro distributor, I would almost describe them as. They, you know, really do a great job at being the middleman between um, a lot of the smaller chains or smaller independent markets and allow them to get products like ours a little bit more streamlined than having, you know, having to come to us, the brand, every single time if we're, we're going to go direct into store. And I think that it will be a lot easier now that we've learned even how to work with them, but also how to ship cross country. We figured out, you know, 30 third party logistics on our own for a refrigerated product in a way that like shipping brokers couldn't even help us with. So I think now that we have a little bit more of an arsenal of distribution ourselves and ways of doing it ourselves, we're a little, we're a little more eager and excited to maybe go outside of the traditional idea of launching regionally. Maybe it doesn't have to be regionally without saying like too much. Um, maybe it could be more 
like I said before, you know, you're got to find that audience and you got to go to the audience or you can have the audience there and let the audience come to you. So continuing sort of that philosophy, I think you'll see us popping up in your local organic retailers soon. That is exciting for a lot of people, for sure. Any final words to leave everyone with before we wrap up? Mom, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you say our final words. <laughs> um, I just want everyone to know that um, Pure Batch um, and Don't Fear the Treat are really near and dear to me. And I really do believe that people will if they have the opportunity to try it, we'll fall in love with it too, um, because it is an indulgence. Um, and I, and I really mean biting into a truffle is it just, it just leaves you feeling just, I can have this. I don't feel bad about it. And you you just don't have to hesitate. And listen, I want to sell more product than anybody, but if you have one truffle, I guarantee you feel satisfied. You don't need to eat the whole entire, you know, case. And we've all been through that, right? We've gone to pick up those donut holes, eat the whole box, and you don't feel satisfied. Maybe exactly during quarantine, you know, no one, no one specific that we're talking about at myself. It's fine. Go back. (laughs) And so, you know, last words would just be, give it a try. Don't fear it. Don't fear the treat. And don't fear life's treats either. Because life hands us treats every day. Make lemonade out of lemons. I love that. That is beautiful. You made me really hungry and you made me want to just enjoy this. And what a beautiful message. Yeah, we have, you know, this is a product that you can enjoy and we don't need to feel bad about it. What what a gift. Just not feel guilty for enjoying something that tastes delicious. Like... Yeah. Thank you guys for bringing this product to the market for people to be able to not fear the treat and enjoy something delicious and take care of their health. Thanks so much, Ainsley. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ainsley.